Coming up, progress on the road to net zero food production, sparking food and supply chain innovation at Mars, and the growing pains of sustainability certification in food. It's episode 15 of Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's Food Technology Magazine. IFT members receive Food Technology Magazine in print or digitally as a member benefit. Become an IFT member or subscribe directly to Food Technology Magazine at www.ift-omnivore.org slash foodtech. Welcome to Omnivore from IFT and Food Technology where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. Imagine a world where we can feed more people because crops can better resist drought and disease, and cattle have significantly less impact on the environment. At the Innovative Genomics Institute, or IGI, scientists are using CRISPR gene editing technologies to make those scenarios a reality in the not-too-distant future. In this segment, Dr. Brad Ringeisen talks with Food Technology Executive Editor Mary Ellen Kuhn about the remarkable work now underway at IGI, a research institute founded at the University of California, Berkeley, by Nobel laureate Jennifer Dudna. He offers a close-up look at what the IGI's work could mean for the food system, as well as thoughtful commentary on the ethical issues of implementing these next-generation technologies. I'd like to start out by just asking you what it's like to work in an environment like at the Innovative Genomics Institute where everyone is so highly intelligent. I'm kind of wondering what the conversations in the break room and around the water cooler are like. I wake up every day and I count myself lucky to be able to work with such amazing scientists that are really trying to change the world. That's the goal for for the IGI. It's trying to change change the world. And I can walk down the hall and I can talk to somebody who is trying to make a drought resistant rice for farmers in South Asia, or I can go down and talk with somebody who's trying to cure sickle cell disease or other immune deficiencies using CRISPR. Well, it really does sound like such an amazing experience. And I know the Institute's work is very broad, as you mentioned, focusing on health, agriculture, climate change. I'm wondering if you could highlight a couple of key projects that are focused on engineering agricultural advances. The first project that I'd like to talk about is our initiative that's been funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. That's uh, it's called the CZI. And they funded us on a project for carbon dioxide removal or carbon capture and sequestration by agricultural crops and soils. And this is a really exciting uh, project because we're looking at all of the touch points that um, are involved in the carbon cycle of of crops and plants. You know, nature has the ability uh, to be able to uh, remove carbon dioxide from uh, from the atmosphere. This is they do this through photosynthesis. And so every crop that's planted in the world actually is already continuously absorbing um, CO2. Um, but the problem is is that the natural carbon cycle, um, really ends up in sort of a, a net net um, zero. Like a, a lot of that carbon that's captured by the plant is then immediately released back into the atmosphere. Um, not immediately, but over the course of 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 uh, some biodegradation of the, of the plant biomatter, um, it, it it gets released back into the atmosphere. And so at the IGI, we're looking at the entire carbon cycle. We're looking at enhancing photosynthesis by enhancing the light reaction of photosynthesis, as well as the the reactions inside the plant that build the biomass that could potentially help store some of that some of that carbon. Then we're looking at the flow of carbon um, within the plant, and we're hoping with some of that extra carbon that we've stored, we're we're hoping to enhance photosynthesis by thirty or forty percent, so that extra carbon won't be taken away from the yields of the plant. We're hoping to engineer root structures and root architectures to be able to promote more carbon to be stored underground. The second application that I'd like to talk about is one that we just announced about a month ago, and that was the TED Audacious project. And one of the application areas is an agricultural application area where we would like to 
stop the, the methane emissions from cattle. And this is a really significant problem, upwards to 15% of all greenhouse gas emissions that, that, that are anthropogenic that come from humans are actually derived from the livestock uh, production um, and, and, and raising process. It's a big, substantial problem. And I think we've got a pretty unique solution because we're looking at using Jennifer Doudna's CRISPR technology, the genome editing technology, and using it on the microorganisms, the bacteria and the archaea and the, the microbes that are present in the gut of the cow. It's called the rumen, the rumen. And we're looking at those organisms in the rumen, and we want to use CRISPR to go in and try to shut off the, the methane production that occurs in, the, in, in that gut, which results in the burping and, uh, and, and emissions of methane into the atmosphere. Well, thank you very much. It, it seems like it exemplifies the way that IGI projects are really so multifaceted and bringing together so many different experts. That, that's exactly what typifies uh, what goes on inside the IGI. We promote multidisciplinary work. Um, a lot of professors tend to just work in their laboratory on the problems that they are looking at and you know, sort of sort of right in front of them in their laboratory. At the IGI, the IGI wouldn't exist if it was just giving money to, to professors to just work alone in their labs. That's fascinating. Well, I want to ask you another question, something you that you referenced in the food tech article. I think you said that that we're going to see an explosion of products made with CRISPR gene editing technology in the next five years. Could you tell us a little bit more about that and what and what impact you anticipated having on the food system? I think within the next five years, there's going to be a lot on the health side of the house as well. But if we're if we're talking specifically about food systems, we're really on the cusp of, of uh, uh, I think, a food revolution. I really do truly believe that. You see the regulatory landscape. Um, the world's regulators are starting to come together now. The United States was actually a leader in this space to say that gene editing is more precise, it's more targeted than traditional crop breeding technologies where you're, you're crossing um, different species or different, uh, different variants and it's, it's in a, a relatively uncontrolled manner. CRISPR is a very precise tool that, is able, that allows you to change uh, the, the, the specific gene that, that you would like to affect. And so the, uh, the United States regulators don't consider many, many CRISPR uh, edited crops to be GMOs. Um, so I think that's a that's a way that can really expand the use and 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 product development. What might some of these crops be? Well, I know it's, at least inside the IGI, we're working on things like um, a drought tolerant rice. Right with with climate change, you're seeing more and more uh, climactic variability. Um, there, it's going to the extremes. You're seeing more floods. You're seeing more droughts, more heat waves. So I think that in the short term, in those in that five year time period, I really think you're going to start to see crops that are using, um, that have been edited with CRISPR to do any of a number of things, to use water more efficiently, to use nitrogen more efficiently, to be able to reduce the amount of synthetic nitrogen that, that has to be used. And look, synthetic nitrogen is one of the worst offenders for climate. It, and when you apply it to, to soils, a lot of times that stimulates production of nitrous oxide by soil microbes. And that nitrous oxide is a tremendously potent greenhouse gas. So if we can reduce synthetic nitrogen fertilizer use, that would be great. Well, that definitely makes sense. I, I understand that the Genomics Institute is very committed to focusing on the impact of these technologies. So what are the ethical issues around gene editing that keep you up at night, if any? Yeah, yeah. Did, you know, Jennifer founded the Institute and immediately put together what we call our public impact team. Our public impact team is, is sort of a globally engaged uh, team that's looking at ways to help facilitate increasing the impact of what we do in the laboratory. Now, part of that, however, is ethics and, and looking at bioethics and bioethics. And so we have to go through approval procedures, both at our university to make sure that we are performing things that are safe. We have to go through quality assurance for any product that we make that it has uh, the same nutritional benefits and, and, and that there's no toxicity and nothing that's, that's dangerous about the crop that's made. So what I'm trying to say is that as long as you there are procedures and protocols set up through those multiple institutional, through the federal governments, and then globally, there are regulations that are set up for us to abide by to ensure that our experiments are safe, number one. 
And then number two, um, that the products that we make are also then safe and, and are deemed safe that are there. So I guess what I'm saying is that we can't control what every bad actor out in the world may do with CRISPR. Okay. But what we can control is how we use the technology. And I, I personally believe that the impact of the technology can be so great and provide such positive good for society and the world and for humanity that we really need to use the technology. We can't just leave it on the bench. We can't just leave it on the shelf, but we need to use it in a very responsible and, and ethical way. Well, that certainly makes sense. Well, just to wrap things up, kind of on the personal note, does it feel stressful or energizing to be entrusted with the responsibility of guiding an organization with really the potential to change the world in so many ways? I, I think it's energizing mostly. I mean, I, I'm a scientist. What I get excited about is science. Um, and it's energizing to be surrounded by people that are really, really trying to change the world, that are trying to, to, to use genome editing to help save lives and to be able to help provide food security, to be able to help provide income and, and, and food security for that farmer in, uh, in, in, in India or Bangladesh that might be threatened by, by rising temperatures or rising floodwaters. Um, it's energizing. It's exciting. Um, now, there is some pressure. I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail. I, 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 I really want this to be success to, to be successful. But that's where the team comes into play. It's not just all on my shoulders. And we have an amazing team of plant scientists, of you know, people that are innovating new new ways to edit crops and to edit human cells, and looking at at, at complex microbes that are responsible for a lot of these greenhouse gas emissions. We have some of the world leaders in these areas. And so it's not just on my shoulders. It really is a team effort. And I wouldn't rather be any, I, anywhere else than this amazing team that we have at the IGI. Brad Ringeisen is executive director of the Innovative Genomics Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. Read more about the work of IGI and other pioneers in next generation agriculture in the July issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. We hope you are enjoying this episode of Omnivore, the official podcast of Food Technology Magazine. Help us get the word out. Leave a rating or comment on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, or whichever podcast streaming platform you use. Want to learn more about the topics featured in today's podcast? Subscribe to Food Technology, where you could read more about the people and topics at the center of the science of food. Subscriptions are free to IFT members, or you can purchase a standalone subscription at www.ift-omnivore.org slash foodtech. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. For Abigail Stevenson, it's all about the spark. It might be the glimmer of a better way to develop and deliver nutritious foods to people and their pets. It could be the gleam of a new idea to advance data-driven sustainability. Or it might be the flicker of a blue sky concept that promises to create a more resilient supply chain. Whatever the endeavor, the moment a spark of scientific curiosity ignites, she's there for it. As Mars Chief Science Officer, Stevenson has access to a lot of scientific flint to create those sparks across a global enterprise. She recently talked with Food Technologies' Julie Larson Brisher about leading Mars efforts from ideation to practical application and future-proof food innovation. Hi, Abby. It's so great to talk to you again today um, to find out a little bit more from you uh, about what sparks your joy about leading Mars's science and technology initiatives. Well, thank you very much for having me here again. It's great to speak with you too. What sparks my joy? But where do I start? I'm in the very fortunate position of being able to, to look across the science and technology programs that Mars has across the enterprise in different parts of our business. And what I'm able to do from, from the place that I am able to view this in is really look for those, those connections between areas that may not 
on first pass appear to be connected. So I'm really looking for um, those sparks that just ignite new ideas and uh, the creativity that comes from bringing scientists together and, and just really looking for those new, new innovation opportunities. Well, that's great. Well, let's dive right in then. In our July profile, we talked about some of the insights that you have about your mission as Mars's chief science officer. What do you like best about the role or what do you find surprising? What I like best about the role really is being able to to spend time with our scientists exploring the future and really putting ourselves in the future of Mars, maybe 10, 15 years from now, and looking back from there into our businesses today, and really looking at those science technology inspirations for the future that are going to help shape the Mars of the next generation. And together with our scientists, we have the opportunity to really explore those areas and just place some bets against those future opportunities that could just spark transformation as we move our businesses forward. And that could be in areas of you know, the future of sustainability, how we can achieve our net zero goals uh, beyond 2030, really looking at the future, the future of health and well-being, whether that is pets or people, um, our packaging of the future, how we're going to produce safe food, that, that is um, you know, suitable for, for people and pets using um, less resources and in ways that are sustainable and even additive for the future health of the planet. Well, let's talk a little bit about what excites you then about the future of food innovation and technology. I know we talked a lot, you had lots of examples um, about what Mars is doing right now. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think there are a number of things that are coming together that are really leading to transformation in the food, health, uh, well-being, um, you know, fields all coming together, all underpinned by big data, computational sciences, bioinformatics, and machine learning and artificial intelligence. And that is creating a, a transformation in the food industry. And so th these are all areas where we're exploring together across our science community in the short, medium and the long term. Um, can you tell me a little, I know you spent about 20 years um, at the Waltham uh, Pet Care Center. And can you tell me a little bit more about what's what was going on then and how that has fed your new role as chief science officer? Yeah, you've, you've picked a good time, actually, because because the Waltham Pet Care Science Institute is 60 years this year. And I've been at Mars 30 years. So half of the time that I've been in Mars is really the, the length of time Waltham has, uh, you know, existed, created by the Mars family who really have a passion for pets and a deep belief in science and technology and, and the role science has to play in creating the future. And over that time, Waltham has really evolved from you know, determining essential nutrient requirements to, for pets to being um, you know, very sophisticated health sciences um, discoveries that are you know, leveraging the power of data, insight, machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to, for example, create diagnostics that are able to predict the disease risk in, in pets so that today we can, you know, through through nutrition and healthcare, provide them with with more targeted, personalized nutrition solutions and care packages that enable them to get live longer, healthier lives. And for me, that that uh, mission that Waltham has had for the entire time that I've been with Mars is is one of the things that has inspired me. But more generally, it is the long term view that that we are able to have in Mars, that ability to think in generations rather than quarters, to really use science and technology in a truly transformational, future-focused, visionary way to help shape the future of our businesses. Yeah, and I know, you know, I also know you spent a couple of years in Beijing at the Global Food Safety Center, Mars's, um, I guess it's the headquarters, right? Of your it's uh, our uh, Food Safety Science Center. 
What were your learnings from there and wh- how does that play a part in your role now? It does actually, yes. Um, the Global Food Safety Center is our global center focused on you know, long-term science in food safety, exploring areas that are critical to Mars and the food industry more broadly. Some of these critical areas like mycotoxin contamination of food or microbial risk are really important to the future of food security for not just Mars, but for, for humans and pets everywhere. So the, the work that we do there, um, we, we um, implement both within our own supply chains, and also we share a lot of that work through publications, conferences, um, training events to help raise the bar for food safety everywhere. Right. Well, what's what's next for Mars's science and technology programs? Like on a personal level, like what's sparking your nerd vibes? I think it is the role of, you know, data and computational science together with the perhaps more traditional life sciences, physical chemistry sciences, all coming together um, and how we can harness the power of the more and the less conventional to really help transform the future. And that's what excites me today. Combined with uh, new technologies such as fermentation, new ways of growing um, meat in a Petri dish through cell culture, these are changing the way that food will be made in the future. And I, I'm just really looking to, forward to seeing um, you know, the next five to 10 years in, within the, the food safety area, the food science area as a whole to see where where all these new technologies with the capabilities that are emerging today in the computational science space, how that's going to change the future of the food and the services around food um, industries going forward. All right. That's that's great. And, you know, Abby, thanks so much for carving out some time today with uh, to spend with us on Omnivore. Uh, you've certainly sparked my excitement to see what's next for Mars. And I also know that you are a great pet lover, a dog lover, cat lover. I am. You have a Ph.D. in cat nutrition, which I had never heard about before. I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And a lifelong love of animals, yes, and the environment. So, you know, I'm I'm very fortunate to be able to to mix business with pleasure, and um, you know, to to bring um, bring that to work every day. Well, I'm so so happy to have had a chance to spend some time with you again, and and hopefully we'll catch up again in the future. Thank you so much. Abigail Stevenson is Chief Science Officer and Vice President of the Mars Advanced Research Institute. You can learn more about her thoughts on igniting future-proof innovation in the July cover story of Food Technology. For more than three decades, Arlen Wasserman has been a passionate advocate for sustainability in both public and private sectors, including work for leading food companies such as General Mills and Sodexo. In his recent dialogue column, Arlen says the proliferation of independent certification programs for food producers is fueling questionable claims at best and outright greenwashing at worst. I recently spoke with Arlen about the challenge of ensuring meaningful sustainability claims. So let's begin by putting this whole discussion in context. Uh, you noted in the in the op-ed that there's been this proliferation of sustainability certification programs. What are they certifying? And what's the consequence of there being so many? Because on the surface, it would seem like this is a good thing. Well, I've been studying certifications and looking at how certifications help or hinder food companies and brands and also progress uh, in the food industry now going on since, well, about three decades. And the things that are certified are wide ranging. Is there GMO products or transgenomic ingredients? Is it organic or free from synthetic additives, including use of synthetic pesticides and fertilizers on the farm? 
Are workers treated fairly? Are workers paid a premium or, or growers paid a premium such as with fair trade? Are animals slaughtered humanely? And what does humane mean? And we could go on and on and on. A lot of times certifications are meeting a need in the market. We need someone to validate or look over our shoulder and tell us it's good. Organic means someone's inspected to make sure you're not cross-contaminated. Kosher means according to Jewish law, et cetera, et cetera. Other times I've seen certifications grow out of a program. An NGO works with a the company, they see a problem. The company says, can you verify that we've solved this? And then the NGO says, yes. And now we're going to make money offering the same thing to others. And sometimes it's entrepreneurial. When I was looking at uh, ethical certifications, I found a lot of people maybe 20 years ago launching eco-kosher, strong environmental ethic among many Jewish people, younger Jewish people. And a lot of people were creating their own standards and then seeking companies that would pay them to uh, confirm that they'd met one person's idea of what's right. So you just described an awful lot of targets, right? You, you just talked about environmental aspects. You talked about economic development aspects. You talked about social justice aspects to this. Is, is part of the challenge that all of these programs are trying to define and measure too many priorities at once, or is it the fact that there's not universally accepted standards in each of these? So one thing is we need to look at what does the consumer want? So you and I work in the industry and we might look at a claim such as free from pesticides or free from transgenomic ingredients as distinct from free from forced labor or animal humanely raised and slaughtered. But for most people, food is a very intimate act. You know, we're eating it and putting it in our body and we neither want the unpronounceable chemicals nor the uh, pain and suffering in the food we put in our body. And so consumers do not differentiate as much as we might on this podcast or for, for the industry conversation. It's kind of the same way that things like clean ingredients may seem strange because some are in or some are out, but consumers are just looking to put things that they feel good about and can understand and not have to study and vet into their bodies. And that's what certifications are doing. I think the challenge is that there's a lot of certifications in the marketplace and the development of certification programs on issues that frankly are emerging, hot button issues or whatever. But the programs are at different stages. Now I touched on something like kosher, right? So kosher started in the 1600s in New Amsterdam, now Manhattan, when it turned out that some butchers were slaughtering meat and poultry according to Jewish law and others weren't, but were claiming they were. So the rabbi and the sheriff got together and said, we will inspect the butchers. And if things are going well, we will put a seal in their window saying that they are following Jewish law. In other words, to say they're kosher. Now, fast forward several centuries, there's five major global kosher certifying agencies. They don't all have the same standards, although it's a mature enough industry that many of them accept a lot of each other's standards. With organic, when I started working in the space, there were 37 different organic certifying bodies, and they all had different standards. And for a company on a national scale, they had to pay and pay and pay for the California certification and the Georgia certification, so on and so on, until, the, um, until Congress acted and USD acted and created a standard, a national standard. But when we look at some of the other newer sustainability standards, you know, they're not mature. This is not large organizations cooperating. This isn't one national or global standard. This is company, this is certifying bodies that are kind of an entrepreneurial mode. And they're actually trying to differentiate from each other. There's a half dozen or more claiming regenerative now. And they're all trying to win business. The idea being the first certification to get most of the major producers of the relevant food product or ingredient to agree to their standards wins and the others fall away. 
in regenerative, in uh, humane slaughter, sustainable seafood. We see this happening a lot where there's different bodies and they're basically chasing the biggest companies in their category. You mentioned that one issue that's arising is the fact that some of these uh, certification bodies will allow companies to claim certification based on promises of future results, aspirational goals. So what what risks does that pose and how does that potentially impact consumer trust? Well, I want to clarify and say not aspirational, but there are some sustainable food certifications that let a company meet some of their standards today and promise to meet others by a date certain and use their certification logo immediately. Now, what we've seen in the seafood industry is that sometimes when that happens and the deadline is missed, the deadline is extended further. It's just that the certification or the logo is out there and the consumer sees it and they expect that everything is sustainable or meets the standards. So first off, you may get a sustainable product where it says, you know, we have started measuring and scientifically managing this, but we'll actually reduce our harvest in three years or come up with a plan in three years. But you think it means the harvest is being managed today. The other thing is in bigger companies where claiming certification is a way to differentiate your product, get consumers to switch, maybe gain market share, maybe gain a premium. One part of the company, maybe supply management or sustainability, understands the nuances that something has been granted this standard, but improvements still need to be made. A few thousand people later and two years later, the product's going to market and someone says, it's sustainable in their promotion and advertising and have no idea that you know people change jobs, it's big companies. They don't really realize even internally that an agreement was made that the logo can be used, but the standards aren't met. So they make broader claims than are actually true. Do you anticipate more of these standards moving toward some of those sort of industry-wide objective definitions? Maybe. You know, there's a few things we don't like to talk about in podcasts, and one of them is politics. But I think we can at least agree that Congress is less functional and more partisan than it might have been 30 years ago or 40 years ago when the organic standard was put in place. I've heard the U.S. Department of Agriculture considering wading in on definitions of regenerative, humane, and carbon neutral. All of these, I think, are very important things to have standards set, one standard. And whether they get that done before senior leadership changes is one issue. And whether they get it done without Congress stepping in and saying, we don't want government interference in some industry or other is another. But I think that there's reason enough to know that reducing the carbon footprint of the food industry and our whole economy matters that the USDA is thinking of preventing greenwashing. In Europe, efforts to prevent meaningless standards and claims are much more mature. And if Europe gets there first for global companies, that'll be the de facto standard. Arlen Wasserman is the founder and managing director of Changing Tastes, where he helps companies identify and catalyze shifts in the way business and consumers think about food. You can read his dialogue essay about sustainability certification in the July issue of Food Technology. This episode of Omnivore has been sponsored by Food Technology Magazine. IFT members receive Food Technology Magazine in print or digitally as a member benefit. Become an IFT member today or subscribe directly to Food Technology Magazine at www.ift-omnivore.org slash foodtech. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. 
If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussion about innovation in the science of food, check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of ift.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at ift.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening, and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.